Okay, so during the first three weeks of the ethnography project, we're talking about our social environment and how, how we navigate that. Uh, last week, we talked a little bit about sort of the positive sides. I know Sarah takes issue with the term superpowers. Um, doesn't bother some people, but it, I know it bothers others. Uh, but the very best parts of being neuroexpansive in a social environment. And this week, you know, we had, we're not going to go into the reading too much because Dean is here to talk in person, but in the outline, we mentioned Benjamin Banneker, who was a brilliant black man, um, contemporary with uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was also thought to be a spectrum. And he writes this amazing, um, heartfelt, articulate letter to Thomas Jefferson about the evils of slavery. Um, and it really makes me think about uh, the ways that we have to advocate uh, and how difficult that can be when we're under a lot of stress and trying to mask and, um, and already <laughs> having challenges navigating socially, but then also wanting to do the right thing for our, ourselves and for other people. And I thought Dina was the perfect person to talk about that because she's done so much advocacy. We've been friends for many years. Um, I'm all, it always feels weird to me when people like introduce me with a long list of accomplishments. So I was just gonna leave it to you, Dina, to talk about a little about what you've been doing, what, what you're personally most proud of, and also talk a little bit about the pitfalls and um, necessities of advocacy. Well, this is really funny because my husband and I watched Tar last night. Has anybody seen that yet? Um, it's a very intense, show about the downfall of a, a maestro, you know, a fictional character. And in the very beginning of the show, they list all of her things because she's presenting a conversational kind of NPR thing. And I told my husband, I said, you have no idea how embarrassing and how overwhelming it is when people do that because they mean well, they're trying to give you credit for your work, but you know, it, when it goes on too long, it's exhausting. So I think the two most important things right now is uh, I teach transition to adulthood at Towson University in Maryland. Um, I'm wrapping up a PhD. I defend my proposal in February. Um, and um, I'm on the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, which is a government appointed position to advocate for um, research that drives not only policy, but funding for autism research. And so um, while I represent the entirety of the spectrum when I'm there, I'm also trying to push forward the idea that, you know, I hate the term high functioning, but higher, lower support needs doesn't mean you have no needs. And uh, people who have high support needs, their, their needs, their mannerisms, their behaviors, kind of um, influence how people perceive them, but because we often are masking or we, we take our behaviors home and we do it at home, people don't believe that we have substantial needs. So I'm in agreement with the superpower thing actually doing us a disservice because I think it's underestimating the challenges that we genuinely face. Um, so um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I will say this, I'm very proud of the Towson um, syllabus. Um, Dawn is among some of the people, Bridget, I'm about to tap you this semester. Uh, about a third of my class is taught by autistic adults. So I step back and I let them hear from the lived experiences of different people. Um, it's in the health sciences program. So sometimes we have occupational therapists, you know, and, and, and I'll bring Chloe on board because she's so involved with, with medical care and medical needs. Uh, Bridget, I'm going to let you jump in there this semester if we can make a date work. Um, and then um, I don't know, gosh, everybody from Dawn to uh, John Robeson, like, all of my friends and colleagues have just been so generous to just pop in for a half a class. And um, they also have to start the semester by reading a first person account of autism. 
So it is a thrill when they read Songs of the Gorilla Nation and then they get to meet the author. You know, it's, it's, a, it's really amazing. Um, so I'd really love to hear about some, some of your techniques that you try to teach people uh, on the spectrum to advocate for themselves and what the challenges are about that. Because I know you and I have talked a lot about how exhausting it is to mask. And yet, you know, if you really are in a position to advocate for people, it, it's almost, I don't want to say a necessity, but definitely a, a skill that we end up employing. Um, and anything else you want to say about advocacy on that level? Well, I, first of all, I think there's different tiers of advocacy. You know, we, we are assigned the phrase self-advocate, but I'm only a self-advocate when I advocate for myself. I'm just a plain old advocate when I'm sitting on a committee and I'm advocating for everybody. So that's one thing I'm kind of quirky about. Um, you know, I've really been doing some deconstruction around the construct of masking because you know, I'm going to these highly charged, politically fraught meetings in DC, and clearly I'm masking my butt off for that five hours every quarter, right? <clears throat> and then I started thinking, am I being a fraud, um, you know, kind of imposter syndrome when I execute those behaviors? And after a lot of self-assessment and deconstruction, this is kind of where I am on masking. First of all, we're not the only ones. We keep suggesting that only autistic people mask. And the reality of it is it's a human behavior. Everybody else at that federal meeting is masking too, right? They're not being the guy next door that brings you beer to barbecue with when, when we're in those meetings. Here's what I think. I think it's an executive function problem. I think we exhaust ourselves differently than neurotypicals because it's fraught with layers of processing, right? So there's uh, you know, processing the environment for sensory issues. There's processing the language that's coming into us. There's visual processing to try to identify a group we could join into. There's auditory processing because some of us process more slowly. There's creating the script that you're gonna respond with before you actually speak. Um, there's the scripts we carry in. Like one of the scripts I carry into every setting is excuse me, can we go back a minute? Because if my slow processing forces me to miss my opportunity to speak, I need that script to rewind the clock, if you will. Um, I think it involves the politics and the environment in terms of you know, the implications for masking. But here's what I think is different. Many, many autistic people mask out of desperation and out of, um, an opportunity because of the setting to disclose. So in other words, I do not ever not disclose. In every environment I'm in, I always disclose because I'm trying to close the gap in between what people think and what they know. And disclosure closes that gap. But um, the PS to that is I'm 63 years old. I've been doing this a long time. I've integrated my diagnosis. I know how autism is experienced in my body, my soul, my spirit. And I know that I can borrow masking as a tool and a strategy for certain settings. But by disclosing, I may not have to mask at lunchtime in that same meeting, for example, right? Um, and, but I think there are other people, like I work with people getting <clears throat> security and I say, I don't want you to misrepresent anything, but just be yourself, you know, let, let your autism show, don't mask. And they go, I don't know who that is. For those people, we have an identity construction problem, right? They haven't been able to be supported in terms of, um, again, deconstructing their identity as it applies to autism. What is autism and what is personality? What is autism and being an introvert? What is autism and abuse I've experienced from well-intended sometimes people, teachers, parents, versus what I really am authentically supposed to be? Um, I also think because of the lack of employment support, sometimes people are forced to mask you know, if they're trying to work far many more hours than we can possibly sustain. 
So there are still a lot of challenges around masking, but I think that um, if we remember that everyone does it, it just costs us more cognitive energy, that it, it helps us to figure out and prioritize when and where we're gonna mask instead of us feeling like it's a, a fail safe or a default status. Does that make any sense? So you kind of intuitively decided when and where you're more, most effective at engaging with people and yeah. you schedule it or prioritize it that way. Right. Um, and you know, I think that's terrific. I will say this, um, and I, I hate to get into generalities around gender because gender is such a fluid state of being anyway, but I think the social demand for um, socially blending in is considerably higher for people who present as female on the spectrum because women are, are culturally supposed to be social beings. We're supposed to be nurturers. We're supposed to be, you know, the person that organizes our families. Whereas I think like the, you know, the guy who knows all the baseball stats like Michael John Carley or a guy that knows music like you do or like Stephen Shore does. I think if you have that talent, people will allow the talent to lead and just kind of um, manage some of the, the autistic behaviors. That, that's a really broad generalization, but having worked with over 300 people trying to get social security, I'm shocked at the disproportionately higher numbers of autistic men who had long periods of successful employment versus the females who have not been able to sustain employment. And it's usually around a social breakdown in the workplace. So that's what I'm basing it on. It's, it's not studied that way, it's anecdotal. The literature is biased toward that state. So I'm hesitant to say I'm 100% sure yeah. because of the biases, but you know that's, that's one of the things I've noted in my work. How are we gonna do this, Don? Are you gonna call on people? Or am I gonna do it or? Um, so yeah, I wanna, one thing I did want you to get to uh, before we, we break is um, advocacy and bullying because um, that's sort of the theme for this week. Uh, but what we, what we want to do based on the feedback I got from running it last time is that we talk about these ideas a little bit and then we parallel create. People can, uh, during the break, they can go get paints or pens, uh, do, do drawing, select a piece of music, um, write poetry, whatever they've got. We've got about 30 minutes. I think we're going to do that. Uh, and then come back together to talk about how we created inspired by the topic for the week. Um, <clears throat> last, last week, it was clear that some people like to process verbally uh, while they're creating. And so people might want to ask you questions as, as they create sure. and have more of an ex exchange, like a, just sort of a group dialogue. Um, so we can do that. Uh, but before we break for the creative part, I'd really like for you to talk some about bullying. That would be great. Well, Sarah, you had your hand up first. Do you want to ask or comment or share? Yeah, it, it's definitely an individual experience, right? And it, would I be able to pick and choose when I'm asked if I was an attorney? Maybe not. It might cost me my job. The, the social setting I'm in and the environment I'm in doesn't allow me to do that. So I have to figure out how to find a balance and a space where I don't have to mask in between things. Um, you know, I think being conscious of masking is the first critical step. Um, I think the environment you're in, whether you're dependent on someone from housing who demands it, like domestic violence scenarios, like there's a lot of things that calculate into this. I just gave a very simplistic response so we could move into the next part. So any broad generalization is risky. A lot of men mask too. I do think men who are autistic tend to wind up in fields like technology or you know, something like that, data processing, where social expectations are not as high a standard. I, I will, that's the whole point of my conversation is we all have a cognitive brain barrel and that cognitive brain barrel holds our productivity. And mm -hmm. if we're giving all our productivity away to masking, 
whether you full disclose or partially disclose, is to say to the boss, I will be more productive for the company if I can have fill in the blank, a quiet office, a door that closes, the opportunity to put signs up that they do not disturb um, between here and here, um, the opportunity to avoid social outings with the company. I'll have to come in late if I go out with everybody the night before. Um, I'll be more, and, and, you know, you have to spin it in their direction. I'll be more productive for you if mm -hmm. I have these supports in place. Um, many times the accommodations we need, other people ask for, they just don't use the word autism in the description. And that's where you're going to have to use an ADA card and say, actually, no, I don't have to do that. <laughs> you know, like well, it, it's in tears, right? They push you push a little harder. And so, you know, that's part of it. Um, the other advocacy that I do that, you know, Bridget's been involved in very intensively, Michelle's been involved in, sorry, I don't know the rest of you folks, um, but we do do a lot of statewide, regional and national advocacy uh, through both the lens of our lived experiences, through research um, and, um, you know, and that is, an, a, how can I describe this? It requires a lot of social engagement and networking to get those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that's why I had to deconstruct how I use masking because it's essential to get into those doors. Um, now that doesn't mean I don't disclose, but it means I'm on my best behavior, if you will, um, in those situations. Um, now, if you go to an IAC meeting and you watch a recording of me, there may be moments where I get a little impassioned. And so by disclosing, I expect other people to meet me halfway, you know, to understand that this is the manner in which I'm conveying my information may be intense. And for that, I'm sorry, you know, if it's too intense for you. But when my fire gets ignited, it's very hard for me to contain it, you know. Um, and, and so um, I've had to advocate for him at a million IEP meetings. Um, masking does not work there because you cannot advocate with all the emotion that's behind that and not disclose for me personally, right? And so I think that last part, me personally, is the critical piece here. When we're advocating, we can only do what we can do. So even though I know federal law around ADA and IEP you know, in 504, better than most people, I would never go to a meeting by myself because the emotion would drain away from my cognitive rain barrel. Um, I also had trouble stopping once I start advocating for my kids. And so someone would have to grab my knee in the meeting and say, you won. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, and so, I mean, it is very personal. It is very uh, uh, individual. Uh, again, it's all over the place with gender. There are men who mask. They have to mask for their jobs or they prefer that. And I think that's one of the things we're not leaving a lot of room for is the idea that masking can be a choice. I want to stop there because I know, Don, you guys have a thing you do. So what's next? Well, I mean, it, we've determined that it's it's as an ethnography, it's it's messy and organic and I never want to stop people in midstream. I mean, people are getting a lot out of this conversation. So I would just suggest that anyone who does want to create during during the meeting today, that you just go ahead and grab your paints or, or your pad and start doodling or whatever as we just organically go along. Because I mean, Dina, you're, you're a gold mine, really, and I don't want to I don't want to stop you in, like I said, in mid-stride. Um, well, and I want to be clear. I got diagnosed at 40. I've been doing this for 25 years for myself and 35 years for my son. So I always feel like I need to tell people that so they don't compare, you know, because um, you know, there's just a lot of differences between people. So it, it it's tough when you're trying to use generalizations to make a point, but then we have to tease that out and say, what does that mean to me? in my lived experience with usually more than one disability, not just autism or Down syndrome or mental health issues. Like most of us bring a, a kind of a bag of things. So does anybody else have any questions or observations they wanna share that hasn't talked yet? 
Have I offended the men in the room by suggesting it's easier for you? Because I'm not saying that. I'm just saying different. I had a client who was male and his pastor said, well, you don't have to take care of your autism. You just need a wife. She'll be your social connection. And I think that is a very common mindset, especially around very conservative people. You know, if you have a wife, she'll just take care of those things. And um, that puts a whole nother layer onto neurodiverse women in relationships sometimes is because we're a little bit better at it. We can sometimes get, you know, kind of layered on like that. I think this is a really interesting juxtaposition talking about advocating at big meetings with strangers and advocating in relationships. I still haven't figured out what the line is between ignorance, someone else's legitimate needs that I need to compromise with and what's abuse and bullying. And I'm so, I'd love for you, Dina, to talk maybe if just a few minutes about your thoughts on that particular juxtaposition? Well, first of all, I do want to say, how can I say this without sounding so, I think, I think I can do it this way. Sometimes living with a disability puts people in a desperate place where they're so starved for opportunities or income or you know, whatever they need. Now what I'm doing is instead of engaging with their opinion, it's like, you want to call your kid profound, purple, whatever you want to use. I'm not going to tell you how to talk about your kid. I may disagree with that, but I'm not going to tell you how to do that. What I am going to do though is fact check you. Because if you're using misinformation to make your case for that, I'm going to make sure that people know that that's misinformation. And so instead of going head to head with them on a personal basis, I'm looking at the work product they turn in and challenging that. So for example, if you say most people who have autism have IQs below 70, I'm gonna challenge that because we know that's not true. If you say that people who are quote high functioning have lesser needs, I'm gonna push back with all the information we have on suicide and self-harm, right? homelessness, domestic violence. We have that research. And I'm going to ask you why you're not bringing, you're not doing your homework, right? That um, I, I get the freedom then not to be reprimanded by the higher ups, because what I'm really trying to do is be responsible about the information that goes through our, our entity, right? Um, that's probably the highest cognitive demand advocacy I've ever done. You know, I mean, there are some people that you're never going to see eye to eye with. And I think the hardest thing for me to learn was that these people don't like me for reasons that have nothing to do with me. That was a like an aha moment for me to find out that they you remind them of someone. And so, you know, understanding that it, you might remind somebody of their ex-husband and they may not like you for it. And that you can't make everybody like you was like a huge transformative awareness for me because I had no idea that people could bring their dad or their ex-husband or their ex-wife into a setting and have that influence their behavior towards somebody they don't know. I, I still don't completely understand it. Some of this is not understanding it. It's just knowing it exists and making an alternative plan to consider that, right? So if I know that Sally Smith despises what I represent for reasons that I don't even know that she knows, then continuing to try to befriend her is a complete waste of my energy. And I can release myself from the pressure to try to get connected with her. I can just do my work, she does her work, we're gonna conflict. It's just the way we are. Um, and it doesn't reflect that I've done an inadequate job. It doesn't really reflect that she has, but she's internalizing it that way. But I can't fix that, right? So um, I think a huge part of advocacy is trying to see where other people are coming from. Um, and even if you make something up in your head that's inaccurate, if it helps you have peace about the situation, you know, like I think that one of these people who hates me has just never stopped grieving the child they thought they were going to get. 
God bless, I hope she gets the help she needs. I can't fix that either, right? So I don't try to, and, and I'm free to do the work without having to try to bring her around to my way of thinking, because she's never going to get there until she does her work, which she hasn't done yet. And outcomes wise, do you think it makes a difference if someone is actually being mean or if they're just being ignorant or if they're being driven by these emotional pieces of baggage they're not aware of? Do you think it makes a difference? In terms of my response to it, I don't, it doesn't make a difference for me, you know, for the way I behave. If we can't find a middle ground, right? So for example, they're married to the word profound. We're never gonna find a middle ground about profound. I think it's a terrible word to describe people ever. And I'm never gonna agree that that's appropriate. Am I gonna advocate that we not use medical model language in our meeting because it creates a workforce environment that's toxic? Absolutely. So Am I going to then try to encourage them to focus on something closer to say school services? Cause we can all agree on that. Now, maybe I only need 10 hours a month. Maybe I'm making this up. Maybe Bridget needs 10 hours a week. Maybe my son needs 10 hours a day, right? I'm gonna advocate that everybody get what they need. And can we not agree everybody needs more school services that are qualified by good people? Like let's find what we can find a moderate ground on and push that through and stop getting sucked into this vortex of things we can never agree on. Yeah, and I think when, you know, I don't wanna go down the trauma rabbit hole, but when we have a history of trauma and being excluded, we tend to say yes, just because we're afraid there'll never be another opportunity. So worthiness becomes part of it. But I also think uh, the fuel, if you will, for the fire for bullying and abuse is uh, isolation, you know, because I mean, I have colleagues who say, hey, I've got a conference coming up. They wanna pay me X number of dollars. Is that a fair market rate? And I'm like, absolutely not. You know, I mean, like we have to have fellow colleagues and, fr and friends. And I have a lot of professional mentors that I can call up and say, hey, you've worked with this person for a long time. You have a reputation of being very trustworthy. I need to have a confidential conversation. How do I work around this individual because it's interfering with the committee's progress? And they, they'll just tell me, you can't. Like, so sometimes we, we need just this intimate group of people who can say, you don't wanna work with this person because they do this. They're toxic or they'll dump everything on you. You don't wanna, be part of this organization because they stole money from a colleague. Like if you're so isolated that you don't get that feedback from the community, you're more vulnerable to victimization too, I think. I guess it's like seven years ago now or something crazy. But I felt like that was, at least for me, sort of a beginning point where that, that whole idea became crystallized, that kind of web of advocacy and uh, like Dina said, relying on each other for the for a sense of reality, just like anyone does. You know, is this fair? Is this right? Is this a fair boundary? Am I being reasonable? Those are all really important cultural elements um, that that we it, it's good to record and talk about um, because it is cultural and we, and that is part of. Um, neuro expansive culture for sure. Yeah, I mean, I only write like two words. It's just enough to trigger me, but whatever. Um, but if it doesn't work for you, I mean, when you have moments where you're you're feeling on, on point, make a list of those people, right? And put it next to your phone or next to your bed or whatever. The other thing that I don't have is high maintenance friends. Most of my friends are I mean, Don, we didn't talk for eight months and you just emailed me and it was like no time had passed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I just asked Bridget to speak to my class, even though I haven't seen her in a, several meetings, you know? And, and so most of my relationships don't require, I think that's a very neurotypical friend, framework to think about relationships. I don't think we have to, uh, I think we have to have a strong foundation for a relationship. But I don't think, I like I have friends that I haven't seen in seven or eight years. And if I say I'm gonna be in Milwaukee, they drop everything to spend time with me. Uh, they want 
freedom. You know, they want to um, have lower maintenance requirements in relationships. I always say, <clears throat> when I was in third, my 30s, women wanted to talk about recipes and they wanted to socialize and they were competitive. And then when I got to menopause, all of my friends got like me. They want to have these very narrow opportunities for conversation. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to go out down to a rabbit hole and stay up to one in the morning when I do finally talk to them. I've had that happen a lot. But it, it also means that I don't demand that you remember my birthday. I don't demand that you're in constant contact with me. I trust that you know I love you and appreciate you and I'm here for you at two in the morning if you need me. But, you know, I don't, I don't need you to be there for me all the time for us to be close. Um, the quality of the friendship is really important. I mean, I, I think of you as a good friend, Dina, and we've never met in person. <laughs> and I think Roger's been um, really prescient in his awareness that um, online relationships are really important for Spectrum people and has um, provided so many opportunities for that. Um, and I, I do think that, that sort of the framework Dina lined out, uh, short of menopause though, glad you're enjoying <laughs> it, <laughs> is that we can, we can have these expectations that people are gonna give you a break. They're gonna love you for who you are they're going to be there when you need them, when you need them, you know, they will be there for you. I, I believe me, I know what you're talking about. You and I have talked a little bit about this privately, and I, I don't want to minimize what you're saying at all. But I think we can help each other practice raising one another to those standards. I mean, I certainly, um, I know everybody that, that I know here is open to to feedback uh, about you know, being held accountable, which we've talked in other meetings, the importance socially of holding people accountable and raising, raising each other up. So um, it's an ongoing process. I, I feel where you're at, but I do think we can, we can help each other do that. And I recommend this book by Glass. It, it, as you're reading a caricature, you're gonna go, oh, that is Charlie. It's called um, Toxic People. Okay. Um, but you're going to read it and you're going to go, oh, that was my boss from the printing company. He <laughs> was like that. And now I understand why, right. you know, she just says that this person behaves in these ways, get the hell out of Dodge. Like it's never <laughs> going to work, you know? And to just, and I also think, Diane, you said something really important and I don't want that to slide by. It's a struggle until we recover, whether we're recovering from uh, dependency, whether we're recovering from abusive relationships, whether we're recovering from that in, in, um, internalizing process of knowing who we are through the lens of, Is this a, she's okay, like, bring good. them cookies and bring them milk and, and be very grateful to them and they'll be fine. You know, like she does tell you what you're looking for, but I can draw a boundary and say, I'm not going to be in your space when you you know, I wouldn't choose you as a friend. So I'm not <laughs> going to let you into my space as a family member if you're toxic. I, I had a client whose mother would call her every day and, and just dump on her. Not even her problem. She would just berate her and abuse her. And I said, put a post-it note by the telephone with the script you're going to use. And she called me like a week later. She goes, it worked. But you're right. I think when you're engaged and trying to hear the conversation and you're feeling overwhelmed and, and put upon and too many emotions. So you have to give yourself a visual that reminds you that you can hang up, that has those scripts on it, you know, um, or it may be time for a bigger conversation that says, I love you and I care about you. But, you know, I, the frequency that you're calling me at really is taking away a lot of my capacity to function every day. And, you know, I'd really appreciate it if we could set up a touch base like once a month, right? So you're not saying I don't wanna to talk to you. You're putting a boundary around the frequency and the timing so that it doesn't come at a bad time. 
It doesn't go until two o'clock in the morning, you know. Um, so that's a little like halfway point to, a, you know, getting out of the relationship entirely. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and it's a way for you to pack practice baby steps on boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and you may have to write it. You may not be able, like, I can't have those conversations verbally because I already have uh, an auditory processing challenge. And so that's gonna be the worst mode for me to draw boundaries. I'll have to write it to them and, and get, get the situation dealt with that way. But uh, going back to what we were saying about the importance of supporting one another, um, on the Facebook page that where we were sharing last week after the meeting was really interesting conversations. A lot of people did go ahead and post what they had created and their thoughts. And um, thank you, Jean, for, for doing that. You really, you really uh, posted a lot, of, a lot of great responses and uh, really appreciated that. So we were so, so lucky to have Dina today. And this was, you know, I'm so glad we recorded this for, to help other people as well as what mm. we did here today for one another. Um, but let's keep up that spirit of, of really supporting each other and having, having that web of validation um, by going to the, the Facebook page and, and um, putting up there what, we've, what we create in response to today's conversation. I really love to hear what you guys come up with or take a picture of what you paint or sky's the limit and I'll be there looking for it. So um, what a fantastic conversation. I appreciate you all so much and um, always look forward to this day of the week to see everyone. So and, and I think oh. if you're, you know, people who are learning how to create boundaries, you know, maybe your, your take home is to create five scripts of something you can say to get off the phone, whether it's a family member or a salesman, right? Yes, and if you have any, um, any links or hard copy examples of that, Dina, uh, that would be great for you to post on the Facebook page as well for people to engage with, because um, that's very much a cultural thing, those scripts that we use that are successful. So I would appreciate that. Excellent. And thank you, Enrico, for, for making the effort to be here. Glad to hear your words and everyone else. Okay. Bye.